Hey, so glad that you have joined us, Ethan here. If I haven't met you or if you're new to all things Church on the Move, I'm one of the pastors at Church on the Move and this is Church on the Move Broken Arrow Online. We bring this to you each week so that no matter where you are, uh, you can kind of follow along with what we believe God's saying to our church. And during the season, we've been answering a question and the question is this, why church? And the role that the church plays in our life and the role that we play in the church really has everything to do with what God is doing in the earth today. And so as we've been unpacking this, one of the things that we knew that we wanted to talk about, and we've kind of reserved it for this week and next week, is talking about the role of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to talk to you just for a little bit about what the Holy Spirit means for you and me today and what we do to be led by the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is really more than just part of God, although he is. We say there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is God's presence in the earth today, but even more personally, the Holy Spirit is God's power working in you to live the life that God has called you to live. In fact, that's what we see Jesus tell his disciples in Luke in Luke chapter 24, there's this kind of famous scene. You may have heard it referred to as the road to Emmaus. This is two disciples or this group of disciples that are they're walking on this, this particular road uh, to a town called Emmaus. And as they're walking, they're really discouraged because Jesus has been crucified, he's died. And in their mind, that's kind of the end of the story. And so Jesus shows up and he kind of straightens out their thinking and he shows them that it's actually better for them that this happened, that he died, that he was buried and eventually was raised from death to new life and it, that it impacts them and ultimately it impacts the rest of human uh, history and the future for every single one of us was impacted by this. But it's not just through him, as he tells these disciples, it's actually through the work of the Holy Spirit that he's gonna send them. This is what Luke chapter 24, verse 45 says. It says, then after this conversation and after he's been talking to these disciples, it says this, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It's also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. This is the message, that there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. He says, you are witnesses of these things. That's the message, that's the good news, that's the gospel. But then he says this, and this is really powerful. He says, and now I send you the Holy Spirit, just as my father promised, but stay in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. See, the life that God wants us to live, this dynamic, overflowing, full of God's goodness kind of life is directly connected to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. The other, uh, couple, well, maybe a couple months ago now, uh, right before the shutdown, I was traveling with a friend. And this friend of mine is a car buff, loves cars. And we were gonna be in this city for a couple days together. And as we landed, we went to the rental car, uh, counter, the rental car counter, they gave us the keys to the car. We walk outside and we realize that the car that it, they've given us is a Hyundai not so fast. And I don't know if you've ever had a car like that. I've had a couple of cars like that. Uh, it gets its name from the sound the engine makes when you push down the gas. You push down the gas and the car kind of goes not so fast. Let me process this information. And in a couple of seconds, I'll turn your foot pushing down into some power moving forward. And that's kind of what happened. We were pulling out of the lot. And as we were pulling out of the, the parking lot, I see my friend, he's, he's looking out the window at the row of sports cars as we're pulling out. You know what I'm talking about? There's all the sports cars lined up there at the rental car agency. And this is the moment when you're a dad and you're on vacation with your family when you go, man, if there were just like three fewer of us, I would totally get one of those cars. And I see him looking out there and I see the car that we're in. And I know he's a car buff. And so I kind of laugh and I said, you, you'd love to be driving one of those cars instead, wouldn't you? He said, yeah. And so I said, hey, let's do this. Like I pulled over, I, I, I got out of the car and I went into the uh, rental car counter and the manager just happened to be in there when I walked in. I said, hey, well, how much would it cost? I'm just curious, I don't know that I wanna do it, but you know, how much would it cost to upgrade to one of the sports cars? And he said, well, let me look. And he kind of gets on the computer and he's looking and he says, well, actually we don't have very many of them booked right now. He said, so I'll just, I'll, I'll change you guys to, to one of those uh, for free if you want to, to which I said, absolutely, let's do it. So we we uh, grabbed our luggage out of this little this little car that we had and we put it in one of these sports cars and it was a, a convertible and it was one of the brand new Mazdas. It's like, a uh, just they had just come out with, it's kind of the new version of the Miata, right? So it's 
is a really cool car, uh, it's convertible, and we pulled out of that parking lot like our hair was on fire, baby. We just did a wheelie out of that parking lot, smoke coming out of the tires, not really, but that's how I pictured it in my head, right? So we're pulling out, we had a great trip just driving around uh, in this sports car. And it was a totally different experience because of the upgrade in power. Can I tell you this? In a really simple way, the Holy Spirit is like that for you and me. The Holy Spirit's not a sports car, don't get it mixed up, but that's a great picture of what it's meant to be like to live the life that God's called us to live with the power of the Holy Spirit. See, far too many believers understand the message of the gospel and they understand what it means to have faith in Christ and feel like their eternity is secure, but they're not really living with that kind of Holy Spirit power in their life today. The reason that Jesus said, it's better for me to leave, it's better for me not to bodily be here, is because he, he knew that you and I would need to have a different kind of presence of God in our life every single day. Not just a teacher or a rabbi or a Messiah that we could go talk to when we needed something, but God in us, empowering us for everything that we need in our life. See, the, the Holy Spirit given to us, to you and me as followers of Jesus means this means that you are now God's zip code on earth. It means that everything that God wants to do in your family, in you and in the people around you, he's gonna do through you, through the power of his Holy Spirit living in you. In the Old Testament, the Jewish people would go to the temple and they would have this desire to be in the building because that's where God worked. That was where the presence of God was. That's where they could find forgiveness for their sins and they could experience the miraculous power of God. But in the New Testament, we don't go in a building to experience the power of God. God puts his power in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this is good news, everybody, that God has given us the power that we need. Here's, the, here's kind of the picture. The Holy Spirit is the New Testament strategy for everything that happens in the life of a Christian and in the life of a church. And as the disciples are gathered, they obey Jesus, they're gathered in the upper room and there's this beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the church in the second chapter of Acts. And there's a parallel between the Holy Spirit being given in the book of Acts and the creation of the world. See, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, the word for spirit is ruach, and it, it carries with it this idea of powerful air that actually has life in it. This is why we see the picture of Jesus or our God through the word, right? Creating the world, uh, speaking and the worlds are formed. He breathes the breath of life into Adam. What is this? This is the spirit, the ruach, the breath of God. And in the New Testament, we see the exact same thing happen. They're waiting and the Holy Spirit is given this air, this mighty rushing wind fills the room where they are. And it's this, this powerful breath, this air of the, the, the presence of God fills the room and fills them. And the same thing that happened in the book of Genesis happens in the book of Acts. What happens? There's chaos and there's darkness and the spirit of God fills it and new life grows. This is the parallel that we see. And it's the same thing that's available for you and me when we choose to follow Jesus, is that there's a filling of our life, not just with the presence of God around us like the air. Air, air is one thing, to be around us, to be aware of it, that it's there. It's different when you harness that air for power. This is the Greek word. The Hebrew word is ruach, the Greek word is pneuma. It's where we get the uh, term like pneumatic tools, tools that harness air, compress it, and create powerful change or motion out of the air that's been harnessed. This is the picture of the Holy Spirit. The presence of God channeled and harnessed through the life of a believer to make radically different, powerful changes in our life, in our family, in our relationships. The Holy Spirit is the power you need for your life. Now, here's the danger. The danger is, I don't know how you grew up, I don't know what the Holy Spirit is like for you when we talk about this, but there's probably one of two ditches that your family or your Jesus experience was in danger of falling into. You'll hear me say this often. For every mile of road, there's two miles of ditch. We wanna stay out of both, we wanna stay right in the sweet spot of what God has for us. And one ditch when it comes to the Holy Spirit is that we underemphasize the Holy Spirit. We don't talk about it much because let's be honest, Trying to follow an invisible supernatural God can be weird. It can use terminology or words that may not seem like they make much sense. And so what happens is very often 
wonderful, God-honoring people backpedal from the conversation about the Holy Spirit because we don't want to be weird. I just, I, I, I want people to understand that I love Jesus, but I don't want to come across as flaky or kooky or strange. And that's understandable. But when we fall into that ditch, what we do is we take out of our lives the very thing that Jesus told us to wait for. He said, you're not going to be able to live the life I want you to live unless you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. So let's not fall in the ditch of underemphasizing the Holy Spirit and his role in our lives. But at the same time, we don't want to fall in the ditch of overemphasizing it. This is probably more what would have happened in the churches that I went to growing up. Some, many of you know my story. I moved around a lot when I was little. Our family did because of my dad's work and one of the churches that we ended up in, uh, my, my parents were helping launch this church, brought in a guest speaker. And this guy was a really talented communicator and a wonderful musician. And I remember I ended up in the adult service, right? The big service. And I'm sitting there in this auditorium and he starts to play the piano. And right in the middle of playing the piano, he starts to laugh. And there's other people that start to laugh with him. And he's just laughing hysterically at the piano and other people are laughing with him. And I just remember thinking, hey, um, Time out. Uh, I, I didn't get the joke. Can somebody tell me the joke? Because I don't understand what's happening here. But what I didn't know is that he had come out of a kind of a, a crusade and a revival meeting where uh, there was sort of this refreshing of the Holy Spirit and people had found joy. And out of that, they were laughing. And what he had done is he had tried to bring that into a place where it didn't make a whole lot of sense. So people were kind of confused and left out of the conversation because it wasn't something that God was doing in that room. He was bringing it into that room and trying to manufacture it. What happens when we overemphasize the spectacular work of the Holy Spirit is we try to manufacture what God did in a moment, maybe for somebody else, maybe historically in the pages of the Bible, and we try to manipulate it and manufacture it and get it to happen right here. Well, here's the way the, the power of the Holy Spirit works in your life and my life. The power of the Holy Spirit is unique for you for the journey that God has you on. Here's what that means. It means that along the way, empowered by God, there are going to be wow moments in our life. Moments that we look at and we go, that, God did that in my life. And can I tell you this? The moments that are like that for you are gonna be different for me. The power that I need for what God has called me to do is gonna be different in many ways from the power that you need for what God's called you to do. If you're a stay-at-home mom, listen, you need 10 times more power than I need to do what God's called me to do. There's things that you need for your kids and your journey. There's wisdom and creativity that you need that's unique. So the way that we navigate that is we don't get our eyes just on the power of the Holy Spirit, but we keep our eyes fixed on obedience to Jesus for the journey that he has us on. To say, God, I wanna live the life that you've called me to live and do what you've called me to do. And as I take steps of obedience to follow you, I'm gonna need the power of your Holy Spirit. And here's the promise that God gives us, that the Holy Spirit will be with us and there's things that he does in our life to empower the, the, the journey that Jesus has you on. So instead of talking about just maybe the miraculous things that we see in the New Testament from the Holy Spirit, what I'd love to do is just take a few minutes and talk to you about our part in obedience of following Jesus on our journey that makes room for the Holy Spirit to fill us. Here's my prayer for you. My prayer for you that as, as we talk through this and as we have this conversation is that you would be willing to be filled with the Spirit. And that means two things. One, it means that if you're just beginning to follow Jesus and maybe you're like some of the early Christians described in the book of Acts when the apostles show up and they say, they, they ask, have you been filled with the Spirit? And they said, no, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Maybe that's your journey. You say, I've given my heart to Christ, but I just... I don't really know that I've had an experience with the Holy Spirit. Can I just tell you this? When you say yes to Jesus, all of the Holy Spirit is available to you. But Ephesians tells us this, we're imperfect vessels and we leak. So Ephesians tells us to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's not just a one-time thing that happens, but it's an all-the-time thing where we say, God, I wanna make room for your spirit in my life. And as the world and the, the demands of life take things out of me, I'm gonna make space in my life to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. And maybe that's what this moment is for you, just a time to say, God, I, I wanna be filled with your spirit in a new way. So let me give you a couple of things that we do to be filled with the Spirit. And really Luke uh, here in, in Luke chapter 24 describes this balance. 
It says, keep your eyes on the mission that God has for you, right? We proclaim that Jesus is Lord and there's forgiveness of sins in him and a brand new future in life is possible through him. That's what we focus on. But he says, in order to do that, you're gonna need the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't focus on the power, we focus on the mission. But when we live on mission, we have access to the power. So here's a couple of things that the Holy Spirit does in our life. And I wanna focus in particular on one of these, but let me give you a couple. The first is that he comforts us. A lot of the work of the Holy Spirit starts by giving us a supernatural sense that God is with us. That's really a massive part of the role of the Holy Spirit. God with us, living inside of us. And there's a supernatural peace that comes along with that. This is what John chapter 14 says. Jesus said, I'll pray to the Father and he'll send you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. This is one of the primary works of the Holy Spirit. It's why many of you have experienced walking through life and, you, and there's just been a, a devastating circumstance or a tragedy, maybe a difficult uh, relationship or job situation you're in right now, but yet you just have a supernatural peace as you walk through it. You're able to kind of have your head above all of the noise and go, I don't know how it's all gonna work out, but I know God is with me. There's a heart level, gut level comforting that happens when the Holy Spirit is filling us. And the second thing that the Holy Spirit does is he creates new fruit. This is what Galatians 5 says, right? Galatians 5.22 is the fruit of the Spirit. It says the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, when the Spirit is living in you, there's things that grow on you. Love, joy, peace, patience. The Holy Spirit connects us to a supernatural ability to have things growing out of our life that are healthy, life-giving things that aren't there naturally. And can I tell you, even in a good society or a good group of people, these things that are listed in Galatians 5 don't happen naturally. There are virtues that happen with a good group of people. Patriotism, courage, maybe even generosity would be things that happen in a group of people that say, hey, let's do a good job being citizens together. But the things described in Galatians 5, gentleness, self-control, right? these are things that need a more spirit-led power to grow in our lives. And the Holy Spirit, when he's filling us, these things grow on us. But I wanna focus on the third thing that the Holy Spirit does. Besides just the miraculous and the spectacular, besides just comforting us and helping us grow new fruit, there's an there's a element of the Holy Spirit in us that is maybe the most important because it's what helps us on every phase, every, every part of our life, no matter where we find ourselves, and it's this. He counsels you or he guides you. This is what John chapter 16 and verse 13 says. It says, J Jesus talking says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he'll tell you what is yet to come. Now think about the power of what Jesus is promising. He's saying that when the Holy Spirit fills you, He's gonna guide you where you should go and where you shouldn't go, what you should say and what you shouldn't say. He's gonna guide you not only into what is true and right and healthy for your life, it also says he's gonna guide you and show you things that, that, that are down in the future. I'm gonna actually guide you, and this is one of the principles of following God that we see in the Bible. Because God is good, God guides. And this, the Holy Spirit is God's supernatural guidance counselor for your life. There's a way of being led by God that you have access to now that nobody else had access to before Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. And one of the great shames of following Jesus but not allowing the Holy Spirit to fill you is that you miss out on all of the amazing ways God wants to lead and guide you. So what is our part in being led by the Holy Spirit? Well, I'm gonna give you quickly a couple things that we do to be led by God. And wherever you're at, no matter what phase you're in and you're following of God, whether you're new to faith or you're a veteran, these are things that you can begin to do or do in a fresh way right now that will help you follow God and be led by the Holy Spirit. Being led by the Holy Spirit is a lot like any other journey we take in life. There's a series of stops and starts. It's not just all one fluid thing. There's some things that we have to stop and some things we have to start. So I wanna give you quickly a couple of things to stop doing to be led by the Holy Spirit, and a couple of things to start doing. So let's start with the negative. There's really, Probably I would say four things that you have to stop being led by if you're gonna be led by the Holy Spirit. Four things to stop being led by. The first is that you have to stop being led by a culture that's not following God. 
Now, I don't think that any of us are in danger of like sort of pushing stop on this message and then going, I'm just going to go do what everybody else is doing because that sounds like a really good Christian thing to do. I don't think you're in danger of doing that, but here's what happens. The world around us, whether we intend for it to or not, gets really, really loud. But scripturally, we see that the voice of God, the voice of the Holy Spirit is very often very, very gentle. Here's the kind of paradox of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is powerful, but the Holy Spirit is not forceful. We say it this way, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. In fact, you see two different moments of the Holy Spirit being given and empowering people's lives that are an example of this. When Jesus is baptized, before he ever does a miracle, before he ever starts to walk in the supernatural power of God in his life in a public way, first he submits to baptism and he's obedient. And it's in that moment when he is obedient, He's submissive to the will of God. He says, permit that I would be baptized to fulfill everything that God wants to do. I need to do this. So he's baptized and then the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. Then he's empowered with the presence of the Holy Spirit for everything that God wants to do. What is that? That wasn't just for Jesus. That was also for you and me to see this example. There has to be a turning down of everything else in order to turn up what God wants to do in our life. And that starts with this posture of obedience and submissiveness to what God wants to do, no matter what's happening around me. The same thing happens in this in the second chapter of Acts when the Holy Spirit's given to the whole church. What are they doing? They're obeying Jesus. They're in the room. They're waiting. They're praying. They're saying, God, we need your spirit to be in our lives, to fill us like Jesus promised. And it's when they're submissive, they're obedient, they're willing, and they're available, God pours out his Holy Spirit on them. If you want God to lead you through his Holy Spirit, if you want to hear the Holy Spirit's voice loud, you're going to have to turn down the noise of everything else in the world. This is what Exodus 23 says. In fact, over and over again in the Bible, we see this command echoed. Exodus 23, 2 says, Do not follow the crowd in wrongdoing. 1 John 2, 17 says, The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God remains forever or lives forever. What, what is John saying? He's saying that all the stuff happening around you, it's going to change. Culture is going to change in a couple of years. People's opinions going to change in a couple of years. And that can't be the loudest voice in your ear if you want to hear the voice of God. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we can't remove ourselves from the world. In fact, scripturally, we're not commanded to remove ourselves from the world. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. But you have to have space in your life where you're not influenced so much by what everybody else is doing that you can't discern the difference between the direction culture is moving and what God wants to do. Because God is very often not moving at the speed of culture, the speed of society. And there's a danger in following Jesus that we would just say, well, when in Rome, that, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do what, what is everybody else doing? If everybody else is doing, it must be okay. Listen, what's socially acceptable has never been the standard for following Jesus. And if we're not careful, we allow ourselves to be moved by what's happening because it's honestly, it's a lot safer to move with society than it is to stand alone. If you heard this recently, I've heard this quite a bit when it comes to different social issues. And I don't think it's all wrong, but I've heard people say a lot more recently, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history, do you? And I think there's some good to that, right? No, I don't want to be on the wrong side of history. But at the same time, as a follower of Jesus, I've never been called to be on the right side of history. I've been called to be on the right side of God. And if I don't make space to have any differentiation or discernment between what's happening culturally and what's happening with God, I won't be able to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. The other day, there was a lightning storm. And this lightning storm, it was there was a lot of noise and a lot of lightning and a lot of thunder, and it made our alarm system start to go off. And I thought at first, this is a really strange time for somebody to be breaking in our house uh, because the alarms are blaring. But of course, it was just the electrical interference from the lightning. But it also made our TVs turn on, which was really bizarre. Our TVs were turning on. There was all this noise. The alarm was blaring. My wife was on the phone with her mom on one line and the alarm company on the other line trying to figure out if this was happening all over the place. What do we do with our alarm? We can't shut it off. And at the same time, she's trying to communicate to me to ask me a question. And I'm on the other side of the room. And I said, oh, babe, I can't hear you. To which she said, you know, try harder, right? Like, and so what I had to do is I had to walk across the room to get to where she was to hear what she was saying because there was all this other noise. And I think it's a great picture of what happens in our culture. Whether we mean for it to or not, there's just access to noise like never before through our phones, through social media, through uh, you know all of the stuff that's happening culturally. There's just noise. 
And the first job of being led by the Holy Spirit is to have enough space and time in our life where I turn that down so I can hear the voice of God. I have to stop being led by a culture that's not being led by God. As you kind of narrow that in and get a little more personal, can I tell you, you also have to stop being led by friends who aren't following God. There's gonna be people in your life that don't follow Jesus, and that's a good thing, a wonderful thing. However, if you're around them, influenced by them, and exposed to them on such a regular basis that their thinking becomes your thinking, how they uh, operate in relationships, what they do with their money, how they, uh, how they work on their job, how they interact with their friends, what they do on the weekends, if all of those things are influencing you in a way where it starts to become normal for you to do what they're doing, say what they're say, saying, think what they're thinking, can I tell you, you won't hear the voice of God through people that don't follow God because they're not thinking God's thoughts. They're not operating with God as a priority in their life. And so if you wanna hear the voice of God, you cannot be led primarily by them. This is what 1 John 3, 7 says, says, dear children, do not let anyone lead you the wrong way. Proverbs 13, 20 says, wise friends make you wise. This is powerful, gang, that we would make that we would make it a priority to have voices in our life that are also people that are following God. Now, here's kind of the paradox. Don't be led by people that aren't following God, but can I tell you this? Don't give up on your non-Christian friends at the same time. You, we should, this is the whole mission of God, that there's people in our life that we're getting to share God's goodness with. And this is the dynamic. In fact, let me give you two verses. And when you hear these verses, they're gonna feel like they're contradictory. This is what 1 John 2.15 says. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. So don't love the world. But yet John 3, 16 says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So which is it? Do I love the world or do I not love the world? Well, the answer is yes, but it comes from understanding that there's two different uses of the word world in the Bible. One is talking about the world's people. The other is talking about the world's values. I have to love the world's people without loving the world's values. So here's just a, a, a thing, that, a handle that might help you navigate this. When it comes to following the Holy Spirit, I wanna stay tender without surrender. I don't give up my life, my values, or my decisions to people that aren't following Jesus. I'm not gonna live or act or think or talk like them. However, I'm gonna keep a tender heart toward them. So I'm not gonna be led by a culture or by friends that aren't following Jesus, but in the same way, I can't be led by my circumstances or my feelings either. See, circumstances are really shaky ground to make a decision about following God. They're a shaky place to try to discern God's will. If you look through the pages of the Bible, there are stories of people that the circumstances would have told you that what they were doing was a good thing, but when you actually read, you realize they're doing exactly the opposite of what they're supposed to be doing. Jonah is a great example of this. God tells him to go to Nineveh and preach, but he goes the opposite way. And when he goes the opposite way, what does he find? He finds a ship that's in port and the ship has room for him and he has money to pay the passage on that ship and the people are willing to take him on the ship to go the opposite way of what God wants him to go. Circumstances would have told you this is a good thing. Have you ever found yourself feeling like circumstances are telling you something? You go, man, I, I don't know, I missed the flight. I, 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 was, I got stuck in traffic. I spilled my coffee. I was late for this and I met the person and they were there. Can I tell you, coincidence can confirm God's will. Circumstances can confirm God's will, but circumstances are not how we discern God's will. They can help you. They can say, okay, if this is where I feel like I'm supposed to go, what's, what's everything, what are the conditions around me telling me? Is there some common sense that I need to factor in? But it's not how we make decisions about God's will. In the same way, our feelings are shaky ground to, to, to discern God's will. Every emotion that you will ever feel is temporary, good or bad. And if you make a decision based on your feelings, very often you can miss what God wants to do. In fact, in, in counseling, one of the things that we see very often is that people make permanent decisions based on a temporary feeling. And one of the best, most mature things that you can grow into as a follower of Jesus to be led by the Holy Spirit is to go, I'm gonna allow my feelings to help me navigate, but they're not going to be the primary tool that I use for this. One example is peace. Very often, God will use a supernatural peace to help us 
guide our decisions and to help us confirm things that he wants to do in us. But can I tell you, it felt good is not the primary source of us following God. So many people have gotten into horrible situations because they said, I don't know, it felt good, it felt right. Listen, David was on the roof with uh, when he should have been at war and he saw Bathsheba taking a bath on his roof and everything in that moment said, the circumstances and my feelings all say green lights, go for it, baby. But it was one of the worst decisions he ever made in his life. Your circumstances and your feelings are not the primary way that we follow God. This is what Jeremiah 17, nine says. It says, the human heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. Think about that. The Bible says that your heart is, your emotions, the way that you operate, it can be so tricky because your feelings can trick you into thinking something is right that's wrong or wrong that's right. And we have to have something higher that navigates for us. And here's the, here's the bottom line with all, with all four of these things that we, we, we have to stop being led by. Here's the, you have to stop looking to the future through any other lens besides looking to God. The way that you and I look to the future to be led by the Holy Spirit is we look to God. Throughout history, there have been different ways that people have tried to look to the future, to tell their fortunes, to find out what's gonna happen to them. It's human nature to want to know what's coming down the road. But if you look to the future through any other source besides God, you're gonna end up being confused, mixed up, and very often headed the wrong direction. So what then do we start doing? If I stop doing those things and it makes room for the right things, what are the right things? Well, here's the first. The first is this, and these are really simple, but I think they take some intentionality to actually start doing in our lives. And here's the first. I have to start really wanting to be led by God. And when I say that, I don't just mean that I, I go, yeah, of course, I, I, of course, God, tell me what to do. Of course, I want to know. Throughout the Bible, we see that when God speaks, it's not loud, megaphone, bullhorn messages coming to his people. Very often, it's a still, small voice. And God speaks to us very often quietly because here's what God wants. God wants a relationship. God doesn't just want you to get his direction. He wants you to get it him. And so when we say we want to be led by God, what we're saying is there's a passionate, intense uh, focus in our life to say, God, I've got to know what you want me to do. And can I tell you, I think very often God will let us get to a point of desperation before he tells us what's next because he wants us to be close. And one of the best ways you can hear from God is to say, God, I want to be led by you. This is what Psalm 48 uh, 40 verse eight says, says, my God, I want to do what you want. Would you say that that verse describes you? My God, I want to do what you want because when that's the posture of your heart, the Holy Spirit can begin to lead you into what he has for you. The second thing we have to start is we have to, we have to start being willing to do what God says. See, the posture of our heart is this. God, the answer is yes before you ever ask me. Whatever it is that you want me to do, God, the answer is yes. God speaks to willing people. In fact, this is exactly what John 7, 17 says. This is what Jesus said. He said, whoever is willing to do what God wants will know whether what I teach comes from God or not. God speaks and gives discernment to the willing. It's one of the best prayers you can pray is, God, the answer is yes. I'm not sure what you want me to do and I'm not sure how I'm gonna pull it off, but I know that if the Holy Spirit is in me, you can guide me and empower me to do exactly what you want to do. Here's the posture that we don't have as followers of Jesus. We don't say this. We don't say, well, tell me what you want and then I'll decide. We say, no, Before it's not a menu that I'm picking options off of. The will of God is not some a la carte thing that I pick. The, the will of God is what is, is, is formed in our life by first saying yes before I ever know what. God speaks to the willing. The third is that I have to start by looking to God's word. This is maybe one of the most powerful principles in hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. The voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of God are the same thing. The voice of his word and the voice of his spirit are one in the same. John 14, 26 says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you what I have said. God's will is found in God's word. Everything you need to know about your future is found right here. Now listen, it, the name of your future spouse is not found in the Bible. You're not gonna turn to 2 Samuel 2.12 to find the name of the girl or the guy you're supposed to marry, but I can tell you this, 
everything you need to know about, about, about choosing, dating, and marrying the right kind of God-honoring person is found in here. Everything you need to know about your future is found right here. Psalm 19, 119, 133 says, direct my footsteps according to your word. This is the guide for our life. The Holy Spirit amplifies, confirms, and reminds us of his word. So if you wanna start hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, get around God's word more. Read God's word more. And as you do, you'll start to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking louder and clearer than ever before. One of the fundamental principles about operating in the Holy Spirit and following the Holy Spirit is this, start looking for a verse before you start listening for a voice. I start here, I start with God's word and I go, I don't know what to do in this situation. I need direction, I need confirmation, I need peace, I need wisdom for this situation in my life. Start by reading, studying, and amplifying the voice of God's word in your life and what you'll find is that right along with it, the voice of the Holy Spirit starts to rise. You'll start to have that confidence to take the steps that he gives you because we've started with God's word. Number four is this, we have to start by asking the Holy Spirit to be our guide. It's really simple, but we actually have to ask to say this, I, I want to know what to, what, to, what to want, what to do, where to go. I want to hear from you, Holy Spirit. Will you speak to me? And it sounds really simple, but can I tell you this? The Holy Spirit is always a gentleman, always moving at the speed that you're ready to move. Never forceful, never, never wedging his way into your world, always working hand in hand with you to follow Jesus in power. This is what James 4.2 says. He says simply, you don't have because you don't ask. And I would say this, that if you're in a place where you're saying, yes, Ethan, yes, I wanna be led by God. I want the Holy Spirit to be working in my life. I wanna have that kind of power to do what God's called me to do. Ask and you will receive. This is the promise that we have from God when it comes to the Holy Spirit. So let me give you a couple of, of ideas to speed up the work of God in your life. You say, Ethan, do you have any hacks? Do you have any uh, you know, fast forward buttons for me? Yeah, I do, I have a couple. Number one is this, when we ask, we ask humbly. This is what Psalm 25, nine says. It says, he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. God always talks to, leads, and speaks to humble people. When you ask humbly and you say, God, honestly, I don't know which way to go. I don't know what to do, but I want more of you in my life. Holy Spirit, will you lead me and guide me? That's the first step to fast forwarding God speaking to you. The second thing is we ask expectantly. Your expectation is directly tied to what God can do in your life. This is what James 1, 5, and 6 say. If you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him. He will gladly tell you, for he always is ready to give bountifully his supply of wisdom to all who ask. He will not resent it. But when you ask him, be sure that you really expect him to tell you. Here's why. A doubtful mind will be as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. When you say, God, I want you to speak to me, but you're not really expecting it. And you're thinking, I might have to figure this out on my own. I might have to do it my way. Can I tell you, you're gonna be double-minded. You're gonna have two minds and you're gonna be confused. But when you say, God, I'm here, I'm humble, and I'm asking, believing that you're going to speak to me, he always will. Which means this, is that we also have to start listening for God's response. And it's not natural, it's not normal in a noisy world to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. But when you do, when you make room by turning down those other input, inputs and influences, and you say, I believe that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm empowered for the life that God wants me to live. Everything good, powerful, all those wow moments of following God are directly connected to his leading in your life. But I have to start listening. Here's what you're gonna find as you start listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit. Job 33, 14 says, God does speak. Those are three great words to write down and keep in front of you if you're, if you're needing to hear from God. God does speak. Sometimes, Job says, in one way and sometimes in another, even though everybody doesn't always understand it, God is speaking. And he invites you to take time to listen without distraction in an unhurried manner to hear his still, small voice. Here's what you're gonna find, is that God leads through what we call desolations and consolations or conf 
He confirms and he convicts. See, there's a, a sense that the Holy Spirit gives us the word. Sometimes I'm just, I have that supernatural peace to begin to walk into something, or sometimes I'm just really, really bothered by something. Can I tell you this? One of the best things you can do is to allow the peace of God to make those calls in your life. Say, I'm, I'm just not comfortable with this. Can I tell you, if you're not, as, you, as you're following the Holy Spirit, if you find yourself not comfortable with something, obey the pain of the bothering. There's life on the other side of it. You go, I'm just kind of bothered by this. There's something, I'm just kind of concerned about my son. I'm concerned about my, my wife. I, I kind of just have this bothering when I think about it. Can I just tell you, lean into that, pray over that, but then walk into that situation and say, hey, how's everything going? I've just had you on my heart. You'll find that as you follow the Holy Spirit's desolations, those, those, those sense of like, man, just something is, it's itchy in here and I just need to do something. When you obey that, when you walk into that, there's life in that. Don't ignore it. Don't, don't kind of wa wash over it and go, I don't want to feel this way. Trust that if, you're, if you are humbly asking the Holy Spirit to lead you, he's going to lead you. But sometimes it's through that bothering and sometimes it's through that peace where you just go, I can't explain all of it, but I just have a peace about this. This is what Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The Verbiage there is like an umpire or a referee saying what's, a, what's in the strike zone and what's out of the strike zone, what's inbounds and what's out of bounds. That peace that the Holy Spirit brings to your heart will help you navigate to go, we can keep walking this direction. This is gonna be good. Let's, or, or let's pause and let's slow down. Let's not go that direction. There's a wisdom that comes through the Holy Spirit through his peace. And as you listen, and as you take time to walk this out, I can promise you the Holy Spirit will guide you and as he guides you, he's gonna empower you. Every step of the journey, you're gonna find this power for living the life that Jesus wants you to live, connected to your sensitivity and you're filling with the Holy Spirit. The more you're filled, the more you're sensitive, the more of God's power you're gonna experience. And here's the beautiful truth, is that when we're following the Holy Spirit, we don't have to see all of the future because we're walking with the one that knows the end from the beginning. All we have to do is take one step at a time. In the story of Israel, when they leave Egypt and they're freed from slavery, they end up following God to a dead end cul-de-sac, a little sandy beach with the Red Sea on one side and cliffs on the other. And you know the story, they're stuck there and Pharaoh's army is pursuing them. And it can feel like, did we miss God? How did we end up here? It feels like a dead end. It feels like there's no way out of here. But in that moment, in that dead end moment, God had something beautiful planned. And I don't know what the story of your life has been. I don't know how much of a dead end you might feel like you're in today. How much of a season you're in going, I felt like I was doing everything right, but I just, Ethan, I don't see the future. I don't see clearly how to navigate this situation with my family or my job. Can I tell you, God has a way even when we don't see it. This is what Psalm 77, 19 says. And if you're, if you're in a season where you're saying, yes, I want to follow God like never before. Write this verse down, circle it in your Bible, put it on a note card, stick it somewhere in your house. Psalm 77, 19 says this, God's road led through the sea. Your pathway through the mighty waters, and I love these words, a pathway no one knew was there. I cannot tell you how many times in, our, in my life and in, 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 in Sarah and I's marriage and in raising our kids, there's been seasons where it just, it didn't look like there was any other step in front of us to take. The bridge was gone, the road was out, we were in the dead end cul-de-sac and God made a way. Can I tell you this? If you're following the Holy Spirit, there's this hidden way that you might not see. And it might mean that the seas part, it might, it might mean that there's a way that you didn't even think you were gonna move forward, a way you didn't think you were gonna go, but God has it for you. And the promise that he gives us as followers of Jesus, New Testament believers, is that the Holy Spirit is given so that no situation is hopeless. God has a plan for you. And my prayer for you is that maybe during this season, it would be a time when you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you in a fresh and a new way. And I'd love to pray for you today, that God would provide that kind of presence in your life, that he would fill you again, or maybe for the, in a significant way for the first time, so that you would have the power that God wants you to have to live the life that he's called you to live. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for each one that's joined us today.
And as we've shared these few minutes together, I pray that your word has spoken loudly to them, that it's a reminder that you never leave us, forsake us. You're the friend that sticks closer than a brother, that we're never on our own, and that your Holy Spirit lives in us. We are the temple of God because your Holy Spirit has been given. And so I ask that in this moment, you would fill us again. We just pray, Holy Spirit, come. Fill our hearts, fill our lives, all the places where life has caused us to leak, maybe through our own mistakes, our sin, our mistakes, what other people have done to us through confusion and circumstances, we maybe feel a little bit less than full. Holy Spirit, would you fill us again? Would you allow us to walk in your guidance and your direction so that we can discern and understand which way to go? And I pray the words of Isaiah over every one of us, that there would be a voice behind us confirming in our ear, whether we turn to the right or to the left, this is the way, walk in it. Pray that your Holy Spirit would be that close to each of us. Give us wisdom and guidance for this season. We love you. We're thankful for what you're doing. Thank you for the power to live the life you've called us to live. In Jesus' name, amen.